why do we tilt and rage in games? And why does this cost us MMR points? How can we break the cycle and learn to love the game again like we used to? If you're looking to find out, I'll explain exactly why. Now, it is normal to feel anger or disappointment when something happens that you don't like. Well, when I first got my puppy, when he was nine weeks old, I learned that again very quickly. Being a dog and a golden retriever at that, he loves getting food and walkies. So when I stopped giving him food and or walkies, no matter how much he had already gotten, to him, that was a bad thing. And the emotions he had about that resulted in him nipping at my legs. By giving me a taste of his small pointy uh, teeth, he logically thought that he could train me to never stop doing the good things anymore. Now, indulging in infinity food and infinity walks would leave him and me deathly obese and deadly tired. Sleeping and fasting is good. We were able to train him out of it, out of this indulgent mindset and habit, and we can do the same for ourselves in games and in life. Humans are at their most creative and their most receptive to learning in a positive environment in which failure is not a dirty word but an opportunity for greater satisfaction in the future. Comparing our eventual success to our initial failure is a healthy and often cathartic process that is far more rewarding than simply getting something done right the first time. George Michael sang, guilty feet have got no rhythm. And I always found it difficult to learn Warcraft 3, an RTS game that I played a lot, when something was troubling me especially if I was the cause of bad feelings, either in myself or in others. Making sure I did good deeds for myself, like showering or tidying up my room or doing my homework or doing good deeds for others, such as doing the dishes, vacuuming the house or being kind and patient and, and listening to people. These things were immensely helpful to allow me to be in a healthy learning state of mind while practicing my craft of Warcraft 3 which was my first big career in life, competing in Warcraft 3. So it was very important to me. As a young Dutch boy, I learned to bicycle at a very young age. Yes, the cliches about Dutch people are true. We are born on the bicycle, essentially, but not quite. When I was four years old and when most of my peers were already getting around on their bicycle, I still had training wheels on my bicycle. Personally, I didn't see the point of transitioning to a bicycling state Without the training wheels, why change a working system? It seemed needlessly difficult. This inner resistance led to me having a great difficulty to cycle without the training wheels when my parents seemingly cruelly took them away. I spent an afternoon falling and crying for what seemed like many hours, though in reality it was probably less than 60 or 30 minutes. Eventually, at wit's end, or perhaps with an intentional measured delay, my parents offered me the reward of ice cream if I managed to cycle back to them from one end of the street all the way back to our house without falling over. I raced home without any issues and I never looked back figuratively or literally. Against the canvas of my initial failure, I overcame and I succeeded thanks to an external reward. This reward also had the purpose of distracting me from the process, reducing fear and fear of falling, and the initial resistance and hesitation that I had. And it made the whole thing fun because it gamified the exercise. And I like games. And against my expectations, I was proud to lose the training wheels. So why is it that we need to learn that lesson of courage, of acceptance of failure, of alternative goals and external rewards over and over again in different settings and in different scales? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that if managing our mindset is a continuous ongoing training that never truly ends and we accept that we cannot reach perfection and then somehow get to a point where we never struggle with feelings of rage, incompetence, inadequacy, resistance to an idea, frustration, then we better just accept that it's gonna be that way. We should then focus on forming the habit of training ourselves to lose the training wheels of all future challenges. We all have our situations where we figuratively or literally cry at the difficulty and pointlessness of some challenge or problem. But once we start focusing on a goal or reward, it becomes much easier. 
By forming the habit of setting goals, we can avoid getting bogged down in the unfairness of it all, because life isn't fair and things won't always be easy and they won't be as we think they should be. A wolf plays by roughhousing with its packmate, and this teaches the art of the hunt and it trains them for territorial fighting and, and, and mating rights. And a rabbit plays by practicing a sprint which helps them rehearse uh, the way back to the relative safety of their den, their burrow. Humans also love play, through board games and video games being a big manifestation of that. With our complex brains, almost anything can constitute play or practice. Learning through play and a positive environment is much easier for us than learning through a culture of admonishment and reproach. When someone shouts angrily at me, I only think of self-protection and learning how to avoid the angry person. And I try to hide my failures or, or lie and, and make up things and just protect myself. It's the fight or flight syndrome, right? It's our inner child and our sense of self-preservation manifesting itself. In a culture of acceptance and of learning and open dialogue, it is much easier to learn because you're now not afraid of judgment and reproach. Many of us are raised by our parents with the best of intentions, but it is impossible to get everything right as a parent. Mistakes can slip through the cracks of good intentions, including accidentally construing failure as only a bad thing. While failure can have very negative consequences, it is a misdirected thought to see failure as bad by itself. Ignoring the situations where jobs or lives are affected directly, there are an infinite amount of examples where failure has no negative measurable consequences that are real and outside of the way we feel about them, our emotions about it. But we still feel as if there are big negative consequences because we're being harsh on ourselves or we feel that others are being harsh on us. Again, this feeling, this culture, uh, stunts the learning capacity of a human as some will tend to withdraw and protect themselves, whereas other people that have a different personality or temperament may attempt to fight back against the critic with all the consequences that are associated with that. Allow me to come up for air for a moment and simplify a few lessons that I've learned while being a professionally competing tournament gamer, uh, a pro gamer. Number one, before we attempt to do something, we accept that this activity is worth our time, regardless of the result. We accept that we don't have ultimate control over all conditions, so we make an attempt. We give it our best or, well, however much we're willing to give, and then we just see what happens. Number two, it is okay to fail. We're going to be endeavoring to improve at the things that we do and the things that we love to do. If we don't do something in the right way immediately, we can try again. If we end up failing forever and don't reach whatever goals we set for ourselves, we accept that and we focus on a new pursuit. Number three, we'll check with ourselves from time to time if we're still enjoying ourselves, if we're still on the right track. If we feel like we're pursuing something that's worth pursuing, and we'll see if it's still worth the sacrifice or investment of our time and energy. If the answer is no, we abort and we focus on a new pursuit. And if the answer is yes, we've given ourselves the peace and confidence and the permission to continue. And number four, we continue on until we reach our goals. Once we do, we may set new goals or we can call it a day. By following these steps and these suppositions, we make sure that we're always working on something worthwhile, no matter the result. We allow ourselves to take a new course of action if we feel like it isn't working out, and we give ourselves the time to continue trying if we haven't reached our goals yet. By making sure that the effort and the time is worth it, no matter the result, there is no true failure. The only failure would be doing something you think you should be doing, and you're doing it because you think you should be doing it because that's what your parents or peers expect from you or that's what you thought you wanted and then you end up either succeeding or not succeeding and then you end up deciding that none of it was worth it because you actually didn't think it was worth your time so for instance you could go to university and you could go study law because you thought that's what you should be doing because your whole family did it but then after a few years after you pass the bar, you realize you hate practicing law and you don't want to work in it. And you go back to university and you study to become a maths professor and you do it and you love it because you love teaching the new generation the beauty of maths. And so it's only when 
the sacrifice wasn't worth the result no matter what happens that we end up feeling like we wasted our time and by being transparent with ourselves and why we do something and that we are okay no matter the result we can make sure that we're always doing something that we feel is important to us next i want to tell you about what is tilt and the superpower of goal setting i got a question recently from a dota 2 player and he asked how to get out of the rabbit hole of blaming your team i know that i have no control over them but i still rage and i blame everything and everyone except for blaming myself. So here we have someone that intellectually knows that he's in a kind of destructive, self-sabotaging spiral of misdirected focus and energy, but he still finds it difficult to get out of it. And I thought maybe it's helpful to, in a granular way, explain what tilt is. The philosophy of Stoicism, that of accepting that one can only control oneself, seems to be, superficially at least, known by most of us. Yet, we often fall short of implementing it successfully in our everyday goings on. Tilt is the word for when a gamer becomes irate and irrational, and when they can no longer perform to their own standards. Tilt to learning is like oil to water, they cannot mix. So how do we avoid tilt and allow us to have fun in what we do? Well, allow me to dissect the formation of tilt. It took me a long time to break down what tilt is in a granular way, but I believe it follows roughly these following assertions. They can differ from person to person in their details, but roughly I believe it'll follow this pattern. Number one, I want to win and I want to feel like I'm getting better. I think that's something many of us can identify with. Generally, you see this a lot. People think they are a little below the rank that they deserve to be at, or they want to be a person that generally improves and raises in rank to make it feel like their energy is validated to make it feel like they are a learning person. Number two, I see myself as a player that generally understands the game and has the ability to improve. Three, my mood is better when I'm winning than when I'm losing. Four, parts of my pride, my self image or my identity are associated with my skill, my level, my improvement and my status in games. This is quite true for me. Uh, when I look at who I am, of course, I am everything that I can be. I am the accumulation of the potential of myself, no matter how small or big that is. I am me. And any identity beyond that is a society or self-imposed label. And yet we do form strong senses of identity, of who we are. What are you? Uh, are you a parent, a brother, a son, a daughter, um, a colleague? Uh, you know, a, a pet owner, a friend to something, anything, to even to principles, right? We have an identity of ourselves. In my Twitch bio, it says, I grew up on games. And without going too much into detail, it is kind of true. I really grew up on games. It, get, it was my first real career. I traveled the world because of it. I met friends and eventually my wife through games. It gave me a sense of who I am. So I do attach a lot of self-worth to my performance in games and it does affect my mood. So it makes sense that if I'm not succeeding in games the way that I feel like I should be, that can be very, very frustrating because my identity might be, I'm a good gamer. So any sign that points towards the opposite of it uh, can be tough. Which leads us to number five. When I lose games, or when it seems like I will be losing in a game, uh, this makes me feel worse, sometimes very bad. 6. Intellectually, I know that I'm the only constant in my games, in team games, and my opponents and teammates, they come and go. I am the constant, I can only focus on myself, and I can only control myself, and everything else is a, a wild card. But emotionally, I feel like there are so many different things that can go wrong, perpetrated by others, that it can ruin games. And whatever expectation that I had about my relationship between my effort and the eventual result can just go haywire and get ruined because of all these conditions. 7. I have certain expectations of what a normal game looks and feels like. And 8. And the final point. When my expectations aren't met, it becomes difficult for me to play well and to my own standards. All of the above points here can be summarized as expectations versus reality and unmet desires. 
it is my desire to have a positive communicating teammate in a team game. But the reality is that he claimed he copulated with my mother last night. I have not verified these claims yet. It is my expectation in Counter-Strike to work together towards a victory. But the reality is that my teammate just headshot me at the end of a round as a joke, casting me my gun. In the house rules of a game of Monopoly, everyone has that one uncle that borrows from the bank and forgets to pay it back, gaining an unfair advantage in the game. In the house rules between my brother and I in a fantasy Dungeons and Dragons computer game from 1992 called Fantasy Empires, it was not allowed to use death spell magic on each other because the impact of the affected player, it felt too bad. Had I played Fantasy Empires then against a random stranger thereafter, my feelings may have given rise to a wave of indignation that this forbidden spell was perpetrated against me, costing me so many troops in my major accumulating troop province, leading to irrational follow-up thoughts or actions. It was, after all, just a house rule. Everyone has house rules in everything they do. It is their own personal book of ethics, if you will. My book of ethics was greatly formed by the relationship that I had with games and my brothers and a friend that I used to play computer games a lot with. We learned that in board and computer games, contrary to this one house rule I just shared about not casting death spell, uh, generally everything was allowed except cheating. There shall be absolutely no cheating. Within the rules of the game, all exploits and tricks or grievous attacks were permitted. Every style, every playstyle was permitted. Until we came together, discussed a certain exploit or trick or, or tactic, and we said, between the two of us, this strategy is not allowed. Not anymore. In a way, we allowed extreme or even abusive or lame strategies because we felt they were a creative expression of the possibilities within a game. The playstyle potential was boundless. If you found a way to kite the enemy forces with a one hero against a force that was 100 times as big by abusing hit and run tactics, it was allowed. The one and only boundary was simple, simply no cheating. As an adult, I know now that some people go even more extreme and go even further. They don't draw the line at abusive playstyles, they draw the line further down the road. Or they don't draw the line at all, they cheat. Take map hack and wall hacks for instance, prevalent in many online games. With enough justification, or they simply don't have a conscience, some gamers gain an edge in games by cheating, actually cheating, and of course this sucks. While cheating would remove the value of the experience for me and take away the fun, some do go that far and they do feel good about it in some way. Others go less far than that and draw the boundary lower than where my brother and I set our rules of ethics. They may play a game like Street Fighter and say that grappling isn't allowed or throws aren't allowed and, and no blocks are allowed. You can only punch and kick. In a game of real-time strategy where you're not allowed to attack in the first 15 minutes, the uh, infamous 15 minute no rush, both players are given a chance to get into the game without a lame early rush tactic. I've had people condemn my playstyle in Warcraft 3 because I don't only just take straight up fights but I perform hit and run tactics. They call me a rat or a runner abuser. Because I have a strong house rule identity that all playstyles are allowed, these condemnations rolled off of me. When it happens that a teammate or an opponent crosses our own boundary of principles that we knowingly or unknowingly have, we are presented with an unmet desire or ruined expectation. I would get most tilted by what I just described by a player that is cheating and a player that thinks that lame hit and run tactics are not permitted because their own book of ethics precludes clever tactics and only brute force head, head on fighting, they would get tilted by a playstyle like mine. Every time a desire is unmet and an expectation is thwarted, there's a small emotional signal in our brain that goes, no, I do not accept this. I have discovered that this is the essential granular explanation for what tilt is. It is a message, no, I do not accept this thing that just happened. In our heads, repeat it enough times, however many times it would take, until our primal brain digs its heels in and says no more. This 
marks the end of learning. This marks the end of having fun. And it is the beginning of our own worst behaviors. All the gamer rage we've personally ever displayed. All the lascivious stories we manufactured about the mothers of our fellow players. Every time I stole a power rune in Dota away from my bottling mid player to punish him for his earlier transgressions against me. It all boils down to an overdose of I do not accept this. I believe every human has a level of patience, which is high or low, that can eventually be overwhelmed with these signals if we allow them to. When you reach that moment, the only recourse and sensible choice that you have is to step away from the game and take a break from the activity that is sending these signals of tilt to your brain. With perspective and opious grass touching, we can reground ourselves. In the process of reapproaching a beloved activity that can nonetheless sometimes raise our heckles, it is so valuable to be conscientious about our inner workings and triggers and to approach it with an open heart and a vision of reality that is accurate. If you are already someone that struggles with tilt and raging, I believe you will never be perfect. You will never achieve a monk-like patience and a complete serenity without effort. However, you can be the best version of yourself with constructive habits, continuous effort, and this effort is going to be worth it as you'll be improving your gaming life immensely. There's one more thing that will really help with all of this, and that is the superpower of goals and goal setting. Stoicism already teaches us that we cannot control all factors and therefore the outcome is not all up to you. This cannot be more true for team games like Dota 2 and Counter-Strike. If the main quest is winning or MMR improvement, please consider for yourself to add side quests, which will function as a goal that is different than just winning. It can be um, learning how to do this one new thing better, like learning to stay alive for a longer portion of the game, staying focused, uh, learning a new weapon, item or hero, staying mentally in the moment. While needing to win definitely can fail and leave you frustrated, trying to win while also trying to learn a new hero cannot fail. You're simply trying to learn. As an example, after just one minute of playtime, you could be in a game where you already believe you're going to be losing. Try not to create a self-fulfilling prophecy here where your behavior reflects your descent into a loss. Don't make it true simply because you believe it will happen. You'll always be right if you think you're gonna lose and then intentionally or inadvertently self-fulfill that prophecy by playing bad. Instead, try to accept in a detached way that you are going to be losing. Therefore, in the future, you have already lost. Therefore, there's nothing left to lose because you've already lost. Therefore, the only thing that you can do is to gain an experience and focus on one of these side quests. You might be playing a certain hero or a certain playstyle and you had certain goals going into the game before. Focus on those. If the goal was to die as little as possible, you may under-contribute to the game a bit in the strict sense of things by not joining as many fights, but these are generally good habits to train and they may even help you in the game and surprise yourself. By distracting yourself with ice cream, you may find that you just bicycled all the way to the end of the street without realizing it, disproving your own fortune telling at the start of a game. I have been in a mind state where I felt the following. I need this win right now. I'm playing below my MMR and losing now would be stupid and unacceptable. The only way that I would lose is not because I deserve it, it would be unfair. I could lose if one of these things happen, something unfair, something cheat, something bad luck. This is a negative thinking that focuses on a future outcome and that is the opposite of being in the present. I would think like, uh, I'm gonna try so hard, like just through sheer willpower, I'm going to achieve the, the result, even though it's madness to believe you could control the result since you're only one factor. Even in a single player game, well, let's say even in a one-on-one -on -one game, your opponent also has an effect on the outcome and sometimes the luck of the game, if there is any. I went to this mindset and though I have never achieved perfection and it's an ongoing process, I find that I'm more often able to achieve this mindset. I am here to have fun and hopefully win. It's allowed to lose, but it'd be nicer to win. I accept both outcomes. 
I will try to have fun and win. And I'm also looking to discover new interesting things about this hero that I'm playing right now. I'm going to cooperate with my teammates where possible. And if they exhibit behaviors that feel like sabotage or negative, I will try to ignore them or actually block them. As these behaviors distract me from my goal number one, which is to have fun. Goal number two, which is winning, which is also fun. And goal number three, which is learning, which is also fun and will help me to win more in the future, which is fun. So next time you go back to a game after a healthy break, try to remind yourself that you love the game despite all of the possible things that could go wrong and that not one single game will be perfect. After all, if you believe that, you can only be disappointed. And adopt an approach of goal setting and enjoyment, which can help you to improve with conscious effort and habit formation. I hope you enjoyed this video and that it was helpful for you. I hope that you can form a set of habits that allow you to get the best out of games and to maybe learn a little bit more about yourself in the process in a good way. Thanks for watching. And if you liked the video, sub to the grub. And I'll see you next time.